Hello there, my fellow brave soldiers of the Orpheus sector, and welcome back. Welcome back to your weekly dose of the Orphean War, the miniseries where, up until now at least, we just talked about the Necron supremacy in the face of the Imperial military. Things are not gonna be much different today though, but we are gonna reach a turning point rather soon. Previously, we talked about the preparations for the Necron invasion, and how the Necron fleet bypassed all defenses and didn't even have to engage the Imperial warships. Today, we're gonna continue right where we left off last time, and engage in the ground portion of the Battle of Amara. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? Virtually unopposed, the legions of the Maynark dynasty landed upon Amara. Ground-based orbital defense batteries and great missile silos concealed under Amara's grey seas opened fire, raking the skies with their power. But the strange half-moon and spear-shaped spacecraft of the invaders easily eluded them. The first sign of the enemy invasion was unnatural storms darkening the skies, while strange, eerie flashes of light and pale radiances randomly illuminated the great spires of the Hive cities. Still affected by the electromagnetic interference caused by the solar flares, communications proved difficult at best. Amara's unprotected tactical Vox networks, long befouled by static, suddenly came back to life, filled with panic reports of simultaneous and multiple attacks. A spectral army of black skeletons composed of living metal suddenly manifested on the great ceremonial plaza of Kaloshin Hive, opening fire on the civilians gathered there and wreaking a fearsome death toll. Slaughtering all before them, the enemy began to spread into the city streets. At Dunredat Starport, Amara's main orbital transit facility, a ravenous swarm of metallic beetles unearthed themselves, erupting from the soil of Amara to attack troop shuttles and gunships stationed in their slipways. The defenders of the starport were swarmed by these machine constructs, which were later identified as Canoptex Scarabs. Elsewhere, in New Vasberg City, the largest of Amara Prime's arcologies, the enemy descended from the skies, the sleek shapes of doom scythes and night shrouds attacking the defenders from the storm-wracked skies, eliminating artillery positions and armored redoubts to pave the way for the Necron phalanxes. The night shrouds and antimatter bombs delivered their target into oblivion, tearing great wounds in the arcology spires and infrastructure until the towering structure began to topple, burying thousands in the rubble. Only a powerful and determined counter-strike by the Space Marines of the Minotaurs chapter would keep New Vasberg from falling entirely into enemy hands. The oceanic, half-submerged Tritonus Hive was similarly overrun, the Necrons emerging from the black waters on great funeral barks. Having no need to breathe and stalking the darkness in search of prey, the Necrons even benefited from the flooded labyrinthine streets and sublevels which formed the Tritonus Hive's principal defenses. In many cases, the Necrons bypassed the defenders' barricades and attacked from the rear or from unexpected quarters. Flayed ones stalked the darkness, emerging from the shadows and mercilessly slaughtering every inhabitant. After this great massacre was complete, Tritonus' air domes and coral-shaped heights collapsed, further trapping the survivors inside the hive. Its watery streets echoed with the screams of the dying. The Maynard concentrated their first attack on Amara's hive cities. With the notable exception of the Dunrad starport, military targets were attacked only in the second wave. The foremost of these imperial military outposts on Amara was the polar base of the Bastion Militaris, the true linchpin of Amara's planetary defenses. The Bastion Militaris was the first to be besieged, as strange, hulking war machines silently floated over the ice flow to strike the installation. The Necron phalanxes proved unstoppable, ignoring the large rents stored in their formation by the base's plasma cannons as they closed in on the Bastion Militaris. The base's curtain wall, composed of solid granite, was destroyed by flashing blasts of energy and strange waves of seismic force, crumbling as if they were made of sand. 
On the Markovan Peninsula, where prefabricated barrack blocks had been erected to house nearly a million guardsmen, the mustering armies were simply annihilated from orbit by a blazing, lambent shaft of light. It transformed the peninsula into a plane of fused silica glass, and the guardsmen into smoldering ash. With the enemy materializing out of thin air and attacking everywhere at once, the defenders of Amara were hard-pressed. At Kaloshin Hive, the rampaging Necrons were met by the tanks of the Tekarn 234th Armored Battalion. Unfortunately for the counter-attacking Tekarns, they realized that the Gauss flares of the Necron warriors they faced could harm even their heaviest armor when at close range. Not wanting to let themselves be hemmed in by the streets of the Hive City, the battalion retreated to the city's wide concourse, where their superior range could be brought to bear. Choking the streets with their Lehman Ross battle tanks, manticores, and basilisks, the Tekarn drew their line on the wide avenues, and unleashed everything they had at the Necrons as soon as the foe emerged from the buildings. The unrelenting barrage of shellfire would have annihilated the lesser foe, but the Necrons were made of sterner stuff. Even as rank upon rank of Necrons were blasted into fragments, more took their place, even as the others dragged themselves up from where they had fallen and began to reassemble. The Tekarn watched in horror as their fury did little more than hold back the metallic tide which threatened to overwhelm them, yet they could not relent. With greater haste, shells were slammed into breaches, and the Tekarn guns soon began to glow dull red with the heat of the shells flying at the Necrons. The result was a stalemate, but it was a stalemate that the Tekarn officers knew would not last long. The valiant Tekarns would, however, never have the chance to see how long their defiance would last, as their doom was already approaching. According to the testimony of Trooper Yeon Bak, sole survivor of the entire 234th Battalion, the enemy struck from above and below. At first, the din caused by the Tekarn's own guns obfuscated the Necron attack. It was only when the new foe fired their weapon systems that the real threat became apparent. Trooper Bak reported that the first sign that the enemy was near was when the trooper directly in front of him was instantly incinerated by a focused beam of heat. This same beam also cut through the leg of a sentinel power lifter, causing the walker to tumble and break into flames. Bach further described the unknown weapon's effect as reminding him of the Meltagon technology employed by the Imperium, though this beam seemed more focused and to last a lot longer. Fortunately for Trooper Bach, he and his comrades were just returning from the front line, otherwise the searing heat would have surely ignited the ammunition they have supplied to the line troopers. Bach himself attributed his own survival to pure luck. He threw himself into cover at the first sign of danger, so he was able to see the shape of this new enemy. Huge, black, robotic insects, crawling along the hab spires on their multi-segmented legs. Some of them flew over him, producing a notorious buzzing sound. As tall as a man, this swarm fell upon the Tekarn's rear, trapping the tanks of the 234th Armored Battalion between the Necron phalanxes and themselves. Their cutting beams sliced even the heaviest armor apart, before hacking the crews inside with their bladed limbs or energy-reeved stingers. Trapped so close to each other and unable to move and bring their weapons to bear on these new assailants without hitting their own units, the Tekarns were quickly slaughtered. The Tekarn commanders valiantly tried to counterattack with infantry platoons, hoping that concentrated fire from hell guns and portable plasma weapons would overcome the enemy. But the counterattack was quickly defeated by further Necron reinforcements. These included rapidly moving arthropod like constructs which erupted from the ground and assaulted the Tekans with metallic claws. Fast and able to move through solid matter, these unknown killing machines swiftly completed the massacre of the Tekans. The entire 234th Armored Battalion was eradicated in less than 20 minutes. Trooper Bach himself survived, crawling into a sewer duct where he was carried away by the flow of human feces and spoiled water. His testimony constituted the first account of what the logisters of the Ordo Xenos have since categorized as Canoptech Akonfrites and Tomb Stalkers.
After recovery and debriefing, Trooper Yeon Bok was duly executed for cowardice in the face of the enemy. In the days that followed the initial Necron assault, Amara Prime was laid to waste and blasted into a burning ruin. The main Ark dynasty concentrated their efforts on wreaking a bloody toll among the civilian population, concentrating their assault on the planet's hive cities and other settlements which were all soon under their control. The Necrons gave the fleeing civilians no quarter, nor did they take any kind of prisoners. This left the outer reaches of the hives, where many of Amara's defenders had been stationed in expectation of a traditional ground assault, relatively intact. While the settlements themselves were burning, Imperial resistance on Amara was far from spent. In those stretches of Amara's urban landscape, spared either by accident or design from the orbital and aerial bombardments, ad hoc units of survivors established rallying points, with the most important formation commanded by Marshal Karis Venner of the Death Corps of Krieg. Given the Death Corps' reputation and the adverse effect the proximity of the bleak men of Krieg had on other Imperial units, especially on the local forces of Amara's PDF and the Orphean Guard, the Death Corps had been stationed far away from the local barracks, in an outhive area of New Vasberg City called the Karalsa Industrial Plains. Having arrived late to the great muster of Imperial forces, the 17th and 60th Line Corps found their intended quarters, a hundred square kilometers of warehouse and manufactoria, entirely inadequate. The buildings were deemed not secure, and so the Kriegsmen set out to transform their dwellings according to their doctrines of siege warfare. Where possible, buildings were reinforced, trenches dug, and bunkers improvised. But most of all, the Death Corps engineers made use of the underground network of utility tunnels crisscrossing the area. They expanded the network where deemed practical to store ammunition, fuel, arms, tanks, and men. Safely billeted underground, this foresight would allow the Death Corps to emerge almost unscathed from the initial Necron assault. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the Orphean War and the ground assault on Amara for today. I would ask you how you might have better defended the cities and such, but we probably all know that once the Necrons were on the ground, the initial defenses were all kind of doomed. For the next episode though, we are gonna see the resilience of the Death Corps in action. Now, was the episode informative or entertaining? In that case, please click the like button and subscribe for future content. You can also click the bell notification icon and hopefully stay a bit more up to date. Thank you very much for watching and I wish you all an awesome day. The Emperor Protects